in the listen only mode. All right, good morning everybody. It's Ron Petrinovich. Welcome to our call today. Uh, first thing, I just want to make sure that everything's working. So if you can see my screen, we've got the FEG website up. All good by Jeff. Okay, Jeff, thank you. That was quick. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for being with us on the call. Uh, today is the largest. We have more people registered for this call than any call of the year. So it shows that there must be some interest in what we've got going here. So I'm going to start off by saying this. I'm going to t turn it over to my son, Jamie. Then we'll turn it over to uh, Evan. I heard of the uh, Section 79 concept the first time probably six or so years ago. And I quickly dismissed it as being something I'd never heard of. Uh, of. It seemed like it was out in left field. And my thoughts were, why even hassle learning something that's complicated? Uh, last August, my son asked me to go to a seminar on Section 79, and I went. And I felt kind of the same. However, my son Jamie was really interested in it, and it sparked my interest. And he ended up bringing another guy across the hall, right across the hall, named Arshad. And what has happened is Harshad's gone on to probably write, you know, if you, combine, if you combine his training sales, probably two and a half to three million dollars of target premium uh, since about October or November. And uh, to say it mildly, mildly, it caught my attention. And I've been on several of the Section 79 training calls now. And here's my simple experience. In the beginning, it seemed kind of complicated. But when I went and I listened to the same training a few times, and I got over the language, it really doesn't seem all that complicated at all to me at this point. So I'm, gonna go, I'm on the website. So if you look at our screen, the gray line here where it says home on our website, I'm going to click on that little house. It's going to bring us to the back office. And if you look over here on the quick links, it says Section 79 Training. That is available for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's about an hour long. It's Pat Lang, an attorney from the National Life Group Home Office, talking about this. And I really think you probably need to see that two, three times. Let it sink in, OK? Uh, today's uh, session is going to be recorded and put right there. So you'll have more than one. So Jamie, if you could just briefly in a very, very simple way, uh, give everybody uh, your take on you know, what is the Section 79 uh, from your perspective? And, and, and what kind of opportunity do you see here? Because I know, I know it occupies a lot of your time. Sure, sure. Thanks for having me on the call. Um, you know, I, I'm very excited about this program. Um, partly because, look, we've been talking about the U.S. debt problems for a long time now. Um, we've been predicting that the tax rates were going to go up, and, and last year they certainly made an increase in not only the state of California, but uh, the top federal brackets as well. So this program is very attractive to the business owners that are making a quality income. And the guys that are making quality income are able to save more money and also need estate planning. So this puts us right in front of the clients that are, for me, ideal, ones that I want to spend my time working with. And I'm sure Evan's going to show you, you know, the power of the numbers, so how we can um, help your clients by giving the deduction on the front end, grow tax-free, and have the money come out tax-free as well. But what if the what usually these guys are going to run it by their accountants. And what if their accountants love it too? And what if the accounts were to give you more referrals? Okay? Uh, a friend of mine out of New York, that's all he does is work with accountants. And last year they did um, over $2 million of Target just working with accountants and their business owner clients. And they did about 80% of that business in the final two months of the year. So this is a big deal. As the year goes on and you know, as the, the next uh, two, three, four, five years unfold, if tax rates go up, this is only going to become more and more valuable 
to clients. And the thing is, most accountants don't even know about it. I met with a CPA who's got three partners, a successful firm that's been in the uh, business for probably 30 plus years. And the guy had no clue. He said, yeah, I've heard about it before, but he didn't know what it was. This guy's got plenty of doctor clients, dentist clients. So it, it, it's just an exciting time to understand this concept, learn about it, and use it in your practice. I guarantee you your income will go up when you start implementing Section 79. So with that said, very excited, and I'll give it back to you, Dan. Hey, Jamie, uh, I want to ask you a couple questions, and then we'll move on. Sure. Um, what happened uh, in the last few days? I know that you're, you and some of the guys uh, did some kind of an advertising somewhere and uh, had a potential client. I, and, and at this point, I know it's just potential, but sometimes it's right. potential that leads to reality. Right. So what happened in your group in the last week and a half as far as something that happened when you were in North Carolina with a potential case? and this potential case from Southern California. Just, just guys, so you can understand how incredible this potential is. Well, I got this. And Jay, uh, do me a favor. Get off the speakerphone and talk in your phone because we can't hear you too good. Well, I'm, I'm not on speakerphone. Uh, okay, so okay. Sorry. I'll, I'll try to speak louder. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, yeah, I was on stage in uh, North Carolina. 500 people were in attendance there. And I got, you know, six, seven minutes to talk about Section 79. And from it, uh, a buddy of mine out of Houston has a client who pays 300000 a month in, in taxes. And he said, hey, I'd, I'd love to learn more about what you're doing out there. And this might work for one of my clients. So bottom line is uh, we're looking at putting 500000 a year into this program uh, for his client. And moreover, um, my partner's Bob and Harshad, uh, they were in Long Beach uh, last weekend. They met with the client and the CPA. They responded to an ad that we put in, in paper. And this guy is interested in putting 600000 a year in. So in just two cases, we're talking about over $1 million a year of annual premium uh, on a 5 pay. Uh, the targets are incredible. Uh, this is obviously a very exciting business to be in when you have that sort of potential kind of keeps the dream moving right along, right? Oh, yeah. It's alive and well. All right. So, you guys, with that said, uh, I want to introduce a guy uh, that I've never met personally yet. His name is Evan Harstein, and it just so happens that his dad uh, kind of connected through friends with his dad, uh, who's been around the business for a long, long time. They run a company called ECI, and they're one of the third party administrators that helps, uh, when, when you do a Section 79, they kind of do what I'm going to call the heavy lifting. They do the hard part. Uh, you deal with the client, and, and they're, they're, their job is to keep this thing simple for you. So Evan, welcome to our call. And i got to click a couple buttons here and make you the presenter. So I'm going to click that. Click that, and Evan, your screen should be shown here any second. So, Evan, are you with us on the call? Hello, Evan? Well, let me go back to Evan and see if he's muted for some reason. Evan? Hello? Okay, Evan, Hello? I got you. We Can got you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. And you can see my screen? I can see your screen, and I'm going to tell you, Evan, welcome right. to the call. This is Thank my you. first ever uh, National Life Group training call that was sold out. So uh, great. Uh, apparently a lot of interest in what you're doing. Super. So you guys, this is Evan from Scottsdale. Uh, by, by the way, Scottsdale team, they're right down the street from you. Yep. And um, so take it away, Evan. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ron. Thanks, Jamie, um, and everybody at FEG. Thank you for, for having us and all our, our partners and folks at National Life. We, we, um, we really appreciate you having us on, too, and, and uh, giving us all the great training and support you've given us. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I think um, Ron and Jamie did a, a great job, I think, setting the stage 
for where we are right now and why I'm in front of you talking. So I, I'm really excited that there's all these people out there like Jamie do, doing these meetings and, and kind of, I hate to say it, but spreading my gospel a little bit from the podium. So um, I think that's great. You know, we think we're pretty darn good at what we do with 79. And so I've got to believe some of that business eventually we'll get to work on it and um, hopefully we'll get to close some great cases. So a, a couple things I would touch on that I think they hit on that I just want to reinforce. Number one is I think you heard Ron say it took him a little bit to get the idea. You know, at first it didn't seem maybe that palatable for, for some clients or he maybe didn't understand why it would be a good fit. Then it, it kind of started to uh, gestate a little bit, if you will, started thinking about it. And then it, it takes three or four times to go through training and really understand it. So, you know, that's important because what I'm going to provide for you today on this call and I'm, I'm trying to be wary that there's people, I think, who are on just the call, can't see the screen. So I'm going to try to really be, be conceptual here. I'm going to give you a, what I would think is a 30,000 foot overview. There's, there's no way I think you're going to get off of this call, go out, find your best client, and sell them a Section 79, 79 case. I, I hope that happens. I don't think that's very realistic. I think probably a few people on the call, it will, it will make a dent for right now. You'll go away and do something. Other people, you may never find a Section 79 case. It, it's something that will fit within the planning you're doing. Um, and I think what you'll find is it's not a fit for everybody, just like a lot of other plans you're working on. There's going to be a few clients you're going to think of immediately where this may be a good fit, and others it may never be a good fit. So my goal here is to get you thinking more. And if you want to, either go back to the website that Ron showed you, do the training there, or give me a call. And I'd be happy to take you through this again. So. That's really what I want to do is kind of set the stage, give you the landscape, tell you how we got here and why we all think this is such a good idea. I'm not going to show you how the engine was built, um, but I'm going to show you how the car drives a little bit. So that's, that's kind of what we're going to do today. I think I've got about 20, 25 slides, so we'll get through that. Um, and again, I'll try to be as conceptual as I can for those people who aren't following along online. So as Ron said, we're based in Scottsdale, Arizona. My father, Ken Hartstein, founded our company about about 20, 25 years ago. My brother Brian Hartstein works here as well. If anybody's come across him, um, he's actually our CEO. I am the COO. Uh, at this point, it's really Brian and I doing a lot of this type of stuff. Uh, my father, Ken, is still involved. I think he you know, talks to Ron a little bit here and there. Uh, but the bottom line is I've, I really come from a, a background of pension plans. So I was raised over the last about 10, 15 years in an insurance and pension plan world. And so we were always trying to stuff together uh, as much defined benefit money as we could. So how much can we put into a DB plan for somebody? Can we put some life insurance in there? What happened was it got harder and harder to do things like the Pension Protection Act, or we just found the numbers weren't as compelling because owners were giving, giving away a lot of the contribution to employees. So what we found was Section 79 kept kind of bubbling up to the surface, if you will. And I'm going to show you a little bit about why that is. But what we found more and more over the last kind of six to seven years, it ties in pretty well with Ron's timeline, is that this was becoming even more viable as some of those other planning techniques were just kind of falling by the wayside or, or just weren't as exciting anymore for, for a variety of reasons. So we really got into Section 79 um, full bore, I would say, about seven to eight years ago, where we, we really became a what you'd call a TPA. We're on the, the National Life website. We're one of the companies that's on there. Um, and this is, this is primarily what we do now. So we still do some of the other benefit planning. But a lot of what we do is, is Section 79. So I just wanted to give you that little background on us um, and how we got here today. So I'm going to start moving through. And again, a lot of this is going to be kind of conceptual. We'll get into some numbers. But this is a, a kind of analogy my, my brother likes to use a lot, which is that in, in a perfect world, and I should say in a perfect financial world, because that's what we're talking about, you'd, you'd get three things. You'd get a tax deduction, a tax deferral, and you'd probably get some tax-free income. You know, that, that, to me, would be the perfect investment. I never paid any taxes. Well, we all know we don't live in this perfect world. Um, and with most of our plans, say a 401k, you're going to get the nice tax deduction. You're going to get the nice tax deferral. You're going to pay taxes when it comes out later on. Yeah, I think most people probably know that. So you're getting two out of three. Um, a lot of other plans, you're, you're paying taxes up front, you get a tax deferral, and you get tax-free income. Again, you're, you're getting two out of three of the things. You're not getting all three. It's almost impossible to get all three. But what you're going to get with Section 79, and this is how we kind of conceptualize it, is that you're going to get about two and a half. 
out of those three things. And this is a pretty simple chart right here, which just compares a couple of different uh, possibilities for a client to do for, from a, a corporate level. One would be an executive bonus, which would be deductible to your business, but you'd report all of it as income. You pick it up at 100% as income, you get tax deferred growth, and you get some tax free income. So really the kicker there is under the percent reportable by, by the participant. You're picking everything up. If we move into the qualified plan, you're going to get the deduction. It's going to be 100% deductible to the business. The client doesn't report anything. That's the beauty of the qualified plan. You get the tax deferred growth, but now on the bottom, we're going to pay taxes at whatever our, our income tax rate is at the time we pull the money out. So you're not getting tax free income. So that one, you know, two out of three again. With 79, you're going to get 100% deduction by the business. The client, or the, the participant, I should say, is only going to pick up about 60 to 80 percent of what's contributed as income, and that depend, depends how we design the case. But, but in general, it's going to be between 60 and 80 percent. They're going to get tax deferred growth, and they're going to get the tax-free income. So already, if I just look at this this slide, you know, again conceptually, I'm kind of gravitating to that third column. It looks pretty good. I get the deduction; or only a percentage of it's going to be reportable. I get the tax deferred growth and I get the tax free income. So, you know, immediately now, we're, we're just at face value comparing these things. I'm liking what Section 79 looks like. So I just wanted to kind of put that into a, a macro point of view and say, how is this different from some of the other plans? And what we get into, if my slides will move here, there you go, sorry, uh, is this speaks a little bit, this slide, I think, to um, something that Ron and Jamie were talking about, which is, you know, a lot of CPAs, they, they don't even know about Section 79. And it's not because they haven't done the homework. It's because it's just never been a concept that they've used very much. Or I like to think what they're thinking about when they think of Section 79 is this part on the bottom, free group term insurance. And it's free for all of my employees. That's what most CPAs know Section 79 as. So if you bring it up to them and you say, let's go have lunch. I want to tell you about this idea. If they've even heard of it, most of the time they'll say, Section 79, that's that, that's that group term thing, right, where I can put in some group term insurance for my employees. And they would be correct. That's exactly what it is. But what happens is we layer on top of it, and when I say we, the, the permanent providers, if you will, we layer on top of the $50,000 a personally owned life insurance policy. And it's a cash value policy. So that's the part you need to educate them on, is that aside from just doing this wonderful you know, group benefit for your employees because you like them all so much, you have the ability to stack on top of that some extra benefits for key employees, other people we want to cover, or our owners. And what's nice about it is it's voluntary. So I would point to that as uh, kind of a fourth point here in, in that red section is that it's a voluntary plan. So immediately, and I, I do this quite a bit, I put on my, my defined benefit hat or my qualified plan hat, and then I take that off and I put on my Section 79 hat. But as most of you will know, is most qualified plans, they're not voluntary. You, you're putting people into the plan, sure they can waive out, but people are entitled to a benefit based on you know, what it is the owners are doing for themselves. Really the same thing in Section 79, except it's a purely voluntary benefit. So they have to accept that they're going to buy up whatever coverage it is. Well, just like for the owner, they would have reportable income. So for most of our rank and file employees, they're going to wind up waving out of a plan like this, simply because they're going to have taxable income at the end of the year as a result of participating. Most rank and file employees simply don't want additional taxable income, especially for a benefit they're probably not going to use for, for a long time. This isn't like a 401k plan where they're not getting taxed. They're getting taxes they go through. So, so for me, most, most CPAs, they're going to get this version down here. They're going to get it. They're going to go, I understand it. It's, it's, it's $50,000 of group term insurance. What we want to educate them on is using a personal permanent life insurance policy on top of the group, that group benefit and educating them about why, why we can do that, how we do that, and what it means for the owner. And what's nice about it, again, is that it's voluntary and we're going to offer it to, to only some or all of our employees. So we've got some cases we've worked on where you know, there's a few higher salaried uh, salespeople or executives, and the owner wanted to benefit those folks with a little higher benefit maybe than some of the, the other employees, and we use classes. So just like we would in a qualified plan, we can, we can use classes and, and determine what benefit level we're going to give to somebody 
based on you know that they're two and a half times within another group's level. So there's a lot of flexibility in terms of plan design. But to me, this is this is the important part for the CPA is you you've got to educate them that you can use permanent life insurance inside of Section 79. And again, most CPAs are they're just not going to be familiar with that. So that's an education process, and you you've got to um, show them why it's important. So. The next slide I would give, and this is going to be a hard one for the people just listening in, so I apologize. And, and my thought will be, um, Ron, I'll, you can put up a, a recording of this. I'll send you a PowerPoint, too, though, that, that's just PDFs if you want to distribute that to people. But, but what you'd see on this slide, if you could see it, and for those who can, is basically the, the first thing here is the C corporation. Okay, And we'll talk a little bit about that. But Section 70. You know, we, we really need a C corporation, and that's a showstopper in some cases. But for purposes of this of this slide, and let's assume we have a C corporation. The first step is they decide to implement this plan. So if they do that, let's just use hundred thousand dollars as a nice round number. So the company, the owner, says, "Let's do this plan." From the corporate level, the company is going to write a check for hundred thousand dollars. They're going to write that to National Life. So the check goes off the corporation and right off to the to the insurance company. The the participant or the owner never touches that check. It's, it's a corporate uh, deduction. The insurance company is then going to issue a policy on the life of the owner. And depending how many people are at the company, there will be different underwriting requirements. So if we have less than 10 people at the company, there's simplified issue underwriting, which is a tremendous value to offer somebody. They don't have to go through medical underwriting. On a case over 10, where there's more than 10 people at the company, uh, we would do medical underwriting at that point. So we would then go down the road, uh, whichever of those roads we need to with the insurance company. Presumably the person's insurable. So what they're going to do is get their insurance policy. And then we, we ECI, are going to issue a report to the client, either or we can send it to their CPA, whoever they tell us to send it to, that's going to say, of the $100,000 that was contributed, the company gave you this benefit. You personally own this life insurance policy. You need to pay some taxes. Of the 100000 that went in, you're going to have taxable income you've got to pay taxes on of approximately sixty to $80,000. And it's good, again, it's going to be depending on how much cash value is in that policy early. So it just depends on how we design the plan. Somebody, obviously, who wants more tax savings, I would design it to be a little thinner so they pick up about 60%. And someone who wants the deduction but also wants better loan values on the back end, they'd probably be closer to that 75-80% uh, of taxable income. But ultimately, what they're going to do is they're going to pay their taxes on that amount, and now the client owns this nice cash value policy. And what I always tell people is we're not putting a dollar into this policy to take a dollar out tomorrow. That's not the kind of life insurance we're, we're using this for. We're putting a dollar in. It's a five pay. So you have five contributions. And then really what I want to see is I want the client to let the policy sit for five years and then start accessing the money if they need to in year 11. That's really the optimal time frame for something like this is five years to fund five years to let it simmer, if you will, and then start doing whatever you want to do at retirement. And, and the reason I say do whatever you want to do is, again, it's personally owned. If you want to take loans from it, you can. If you want to drop the death benefit to, to maximize cash value even more, you can. That's how most of the illustrations I show you would come out. Um, if you wanted to keep the death benefit and use it for some estate planning, you could do that. You could exchange the policy. Really, the sky is the limit because it's personally owned. Um, and then finally, the, the last point I'd make on my slide is there is a death benefit here payable to the beneficiary. Um, I feel like sometimes we kind of gloss over the fact that you know this is life insurance, and I'm always talking about a tax deduction and what person what the person picks up is reportable income and the income at retirement. But but really, you know, more than anything, there's a death benefit here, and they're they're buying the protection too. So um, I just like to to make that point to people. So that, you know, this to me, this is, conceptually speaking, this is the slide that will show you how the plan flows and where, where it goes from. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these in here. And there's, there's kind of four topical areas I want to talk about, again, from a conceptual point of view that I think may help you position Section 79 for some of your clients or for, for doing some prospecting if that's your thing, if you're going to take this out and kind of sell it as a concept. So the first one we're going to talk about is better business planning. And that's really what I just took you through on that slide is that you know instead of having your CPA say, well, my client's got 100000 of taxable income. He's a C corporation. I don't know what to do. We're, we're just going to have him pay taxes on 100 Well, you know, this is a little better than that. So certainly from that perspective, you can add some value to the CPA's practice by saying, look, I've got some ideas that might be out there. And if you're sitting on any C corporations where they have some pre-tax profit, 
you know, this is really a slam dunk because you've already got the entity structure and, and they've got pre-tax money and they're probably already maxing out qualified plans. Let's take a look at Section 79 and try to lessen their tax burden. So from a business planning perspective, again, it all comes back to we're taking dollars that would have come out and probably been taxed, we're making them now deductible. And if I can make them deductible and make it only partially taxable to the client or the participant, that's even better. So that's what I'm talking about when I mean better business planning. It's, it's a way to take dollars that otherwise might have been taxed at the corporate level and push them into uh, a deductible type of plan. So that's, that's just a nice thing we see there. It, it will also allow you to do some of these, some of these things on the slide that we think could be important, you know, such as attracting and retaining key people. Um, quite honestly, I'll, I'll give you this one. I don't see it used quite as much as a retention tool. Um, it's not quite a golden handcuff. We've used it a little bit like that. I kind of call it a silver handcuff. And, and the reason I, I say it like that is because once somebody is in the plan, they personally own this. They're not tied to a vesting schedule. If I'm doing this for my employee, um, I think the, the key value I would say to them that I'm providing is that as long as you're with me, I'm going to pay this premium. The company's going to pay the premium. You'll be responsible for the taxes due. And maybe I'll even bonus you out some of that money. It's a five pay. The plan's designed around five premiums. If you leave in year two, I'm not going to pay years three, four, and five. You can pay those yourself. Now, that's fine. You'll take away whatever it is you got in years one and two. But really, again, the plan was designed as a five pay. So I can't tie you to a vesting schedule, but I can tell you that if you leave, I'm not going to pay those premiums for you. So it's a, it's a little bit, again, like what I call a, a silver handcuffs, if you will. But just to go through some of these other points here is, again, it's voluntary. Um, and I can't tell you how important that is. I get people, sometimes they'll challenge us a little bit, and they'll say, you know, what employee in their right mind would turn this down? And, and to those people, I say, well, obviously, you've never sold a Section 79 plan. And I don't mean that to insult them, but the reality is if you've ever sat down with an employee and gone through one of these things through the enrollment process, most of them simply wave out of the plan. They don't want, it, they don't want the added taxable income, and they don't want to go through medical underwriting. So they'll simply say, wait a minute, you mean I can have this permanent life insurance benefit that I may or may not use at some point down the line I, and I've got to pay for now, or I can, I can just have a $50,000 death benefit that the company pays for and it doesn't cost me anything? Yes. Well, I think I'll just take the free one for now and maybe next year I'll, I'll do the other one. That's the reality of how most of those conversations go. So it's voluntary, which means most of our employees will wave out. Contributions are flexible. It's an equity indexed universal life policy. Um, now, that doesn't mean I want somebody to put $100,000 in in year one, make no payment in year two, 25000 in year three, 30000 in year four, and nothing in year five. That will not look good. You want to pick a number you're comfortable with, and if you can stick with it for all five years, that's the optimal way to go forward. Having said that, we get some clients who business changes. They put in one, two, three premiums. They need to make some changes. At least we have the flexibility here to do that. I will tell you the plan will take on a different shape. The numbers that we, we hypothetically you know, told them in retirement they would have, it's not going to be like that. They're going to change. Uh, but you do have some of that flexibility. We have individual design, so I can have four doctors all at the same company, and I should be able to, according to, to how I have to do it, but I should be able to custom design a policy for each one of them. Again, it's permanent and portable, which means if you leave, you take it with you. There is no maximum contribution limit, and that's a pretty big point. Uh, you know, Again, with my qualified plan hat, I can only put X amount away, whether it's a 401k plan or a DB plan or a profit sharing plan. As long as I can get underwritten for it and I can justify the income of what I'm using, I can put as much away in Section 79 as I can, or as I want to. So for instance, we've, uh, two years ago we closed a case at the end of the year. It was $500,000 on, on uh, two different people, so it was a million dollars. Um, they couldn't have done that in a defined benefit plan. We just did at the end of this last year another case, it was 600000 total, so two $300,000 policies. Again, they wouldn't have been able to put that much away um, just in a straight DB plan. Maybe by using a combination of different plans they might have been able to, but we weren't restricted here. No age limits. So again, as long as you can get underwriting for the policy, um, you, can, you can participate. And then I would actually say to this last point, low administrative costs. There's actually no administrative costs. We just 
recently, last month, decided to waive all of our fees. So literally, there's no setup fee to the plan. There is no admin fee to the plan every year. They were pretty small before, but we decided just to get rid of them. So $500 setup fee is gone, and there's no $250 admin fee. You're probably saying, how do I get paid? We would go on an application for 20%. That's how my company gets paid. So we like to say we've got skin in the game. We're only getting paid if you're getting paid. So for that, you know, we'll work as hard as we need to on a case. Um, certainly, if you're local here, I can come out and visit with you, see your client. If you want me to fly somewhere, we probably would talk about you know, increasing our split a little bit. But generally, we work for 20% um, of a case. That's, that's how we work. So the next thing I'd want to get to here is, is the better tax planning. And that, that's not too different than the business planning a little bit as I, as I kind of conceptualized it. But what we get to with this aspect is really, if you were going to sit down with the CPA, they're probably going to say to you, well, what does this really mean for my client? I, I, I follow you. I'm getting it. But let's put some numbers on this thing and see what it looks like. So again, for my people who can't see this, what I'm doing now is I'm really running through um, just a little tax form here that would look pretty familiar to you or to your CPA most likely. So on the left-hand side, what I've got is earned income of 500000 no Section 79 tax uh, plan that I'm doing. Your total taxable income, again, forgetting if you did anything else, you'd have taxable income of 500000 In a 45% tax bracket, you'd owe about two and a quarter of taxes in that example. If we looked at what I've got on the right side, we're showing now if you had a Section 79 plan. Let's say you put 250. You didn't need all 500,000 as earned income. You only needed 250, and you wanted to do something else with the 250. So we took 250 as earned income. We actually put 250,000 into a into a Section 79 policy. Of the 250,000, only about 162,500 spills back to me as personal income. So now what I've done is I've re reduced my total taxable income from 500,000 to 412. Uh, 500, 412,500. In that same tax bracket of 45%, now I owe taxes of about 185. So immediately, this is year number one. I've saved my client $40,000 in taxes, and, and that's you know bird in a hand right now. So a lot of what I get into is Section 79 is people will compare it to other other um, investments, and I think that's great. We've actually got a sheet. We'll show you that. And and a lot of times we're comparing it to you know again the hypothetical of what I'm going to do. 10, 15, 20 years down the line. I think that's great. It's all hypothetical. You know, Maybe we get there, maybe we don't. I'm guessing with 79, I'm assuming some interest rates that we're going to make on our insurance policy. You're doing the same thing if you're doing that on the investment account. You've got to make some assumptions. Well, I know right now with 79, you're only going to pick up 162 of 250 if we do a 79 plan. So again, I, I look back and I go, if I can save you $40,000 right now, and I know I can, wouldn't that be good? And most of the clients will say, yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. And so a lot of times we get caught up in the, you know, we'll look at this number, we're analyzing this. And to me, that's what it comes down to is, is you know, if we're looking at this from a tax planning, tax savings vehicle, I, I know right now I'm saving you 40 grand in taxes by doing the 79 plan. Yes, there will be some other, other things we need to do, but that's the bottom line, you know, and, that's, and that should resonate whether it's with the client or with the CPA. You know, that, that can be powerful. Um, you know, and some back to the CPA thing. Sometimes what I find is you just have to be careful with them. You know, because what, you don't want the client saying, "Well, wait a minute, Mr. and Mrs. CPA, why didn't you present me this idea?" You know, you want to make the, the CPA look good, so you you want to educate them, get them to buy into it, and let them say, "Hey, what a great thing we found! Look, I brought I brought Evan in to help us look at the 79 plan that I found for you." Um, you know, we don't want to make the CPA look bad. So in this case, I think you'd be making them look pretty good. Some estate planning. Some people probably out there going, hey, we're buying some life insurance. We're using pre-tax dollars. It looks pretty good. Can I use this for estate planning? And, and you can. Um, and what I would say is I would caveat this by saying, uh, you know, to be honest, probably eight out of 10 cases that I work on, they're usually tax plays. And what I mean by that is, is the person has pre-tax income, they want a deduction, and they want income later on at retirement. That's probably eight out of 10 of the cases I work on. I would say two out of the 10 take on this shape a little bit, where it's somebody recognizing what they can do. They don't really need the income. They've got plenty of money. Um, they're filling up IRA accounts. They've got qualified money. Maybe they have some cash value life insurance. What they need is some estate planning. And so what they'd say is, could I use this potentially 
to buy a life insurance policy, knowing it's not a term policy. It's gonna, I'm going to be paying more for it because it's cash value, but it'll have cash value if I need it. But could I use this, this type of policy for estate planning? The reality is you could. So just as an example here, you got someone age 50 buying $4 million worth of coverage. So if they didn't use a Section 79 plan, let's just say, and again, my numbers are probably a little different now. I've, I've got to update some things in here. But let's say the premium was $150,000 to buy $4 million of coverage. Again, it would be a five pay. This is planned as a five pay. So without doing 79, you put in 150. Over five years, you would have put in about 750000 Again, the company did. You'd pay taxes on $750,000. You didn't do anything except redirect some of the money from the corporate level, but you're picking it all up personally. In 79, if I design it more as a death benefit play, I may have that same $150,000 premium, excuse me, um, and so I'm paying $750,000. That's what the company's paying. But the taxable amount to me personally in this case, when I use it for estate planning, it's only 345000 So I'm down to only including about 46% of the premiums as income. You know, talk about being able to buy some life insurance you know, on a tax-deductible basis. That's pretty powerful. Now, I'll tell you, the policy is probably a little thinner here. That's one of the reasons you're, you're paying less is, again, that the taxable income really tracks to the accumulated value and the cash surrender value. So we'd have to monitor this and, and make sure we're using you know, realistic assumptions. And um, you know, if we had a bad year one year that the client, we, we managed you know, those expectations and that you know, we were a little thinner than we thought we might be. Uh, but the reality is, when we do it this way, we can bring that taxable number down even further from the 60%. And in this case, you're at about 46%. The reality is I can drop it down even lower. I just think you get so close to where if you miss an assumption one year, you know, the policy, it wouldn't last, but you'd probably have to put some money in um, to keep it going. So, but the point is, you know, every case is different, and until we look at it, you know, I don't know what we've got. So some cases, some people love this idea, other ones it doesn't work so well for them. Um, if we look at a pretty basic term versus Section 79, we get some people saying, you know, why would I do this? Can I just buy a term policy for the same death benefit? And I'd say you could, but again, 79 is not really a death benefit play, but if you want to compare it to that, I'll show you that. So in this case, we had an age 55-year-old buying $2 million. Um, and again, my numbers are probably a little different now than they were when I did these slides. But if you had a 20-year term policy, let's say the premium was $11,000 for a term policy. Well, after 20 years, you paid about $235,000 in premium. That was your cost because it wasn't deductible to the business. Your net outlay was 235, and when the policy's gone, it's gone. You got nothing left. There's no cash value. There's no income. Um, there's no no remaining death benefit. It's gone. Well, the same policy for a 55 year old, two million dollars of death benefit. It may cost us 104 with Section 79, but remember, it's tax deductible to the corporation. We're only going to pay five years. So our premium was maybe 520. Okay, so we paid more in premium, but my net cost, and this is the actual out of pocket that the client would have paid. It was about 115 because remember, only about 60% of that was taxable to them. The net cost after tax to the company was about 312 because that was their cost on that side. So your, your outlay is more with 79, but look at, oh, you're 21. I've got 524,000 in, uh, in net surrender value. We ran some loan income from here. You got potentially $48,000 of hypothetical loan income. That's a 20-year income stream of, of $968,000. So. You know, now what we've done is we've taken it, we've kind of flipped it on its head and said you needed a death benefit, but we bought it in a, in a much more efficient manner for you, and now you've, you've got some cash at the end of the game. What this slide usually comes back to is cash flow. It, and they may say to you, the client, that looks good, but I, you know, I don't have the money right now from the corporation, and I need the death benefit protection. Well, maybe, maybe the term policy is what we have to do, but if you have the money, and you can do it like this, and you're looking for some other thoughts on what to do for, for some deductions, this may be a really good fit for you, because we're going to buy the insurance you need anyway, but now we're going to use a policy that's going to have something left if, if, God forbid, you don't need it uh, you know, in the 20-year time period. So that's just an interesting slide um, when you compare it like that. And then, and then finally, really, the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is, is the retirement planning aspect here, because, again, that's really how we sell most of our plans. Again, it's a deduction, a deferral, and then I want the income on the back end. That, that is eight out of 10 of my cases. That's how it goes. And this slide, again, I'm going to put my DB hat back on here. But this is a lot of what 
we were seeing, which is why we got really hardcore into the 79 game. We just weren't selling as many DB plans anymore. So again, for those people who can't see this, what I'm comparing is a defined benefit plan to my Section 79 plan. And basically what I'm showing you is that the costs in a defined benefit plan for our nurses, our medical technicians, our receptionists, they're excessive and they're extreme. And I don't think any doctor in their right mind would ever give these people these contributions. So we're showing a nurse who makes $60,000 a year getting a $69,000 contribution in a DB plan. You know, our receptionist who's getting $25,000 a year because she's probably 62 years old, she's getting a $33,000 defined benefit plan contribution. So our principal, the doctor, is only, in this example, he's keeping 55% of what goes into the DB plan. I, I mean, at that point, I would tell you to go pay your taxes, and, and you'd be better off. You don't have to deal with any administrative issues or you know, pension plan rules and things like that. You didn't do anything here. All you did was give all the money to the employees, which that's great, but you're probably already doing stuff for them anyway. In my 79 plan, all I really am going to have is the cost of the group term insurance for these employees. So that same receptionist who was getting a $33,000 DB plan contribution, the cost for her in my 79 is maybe it's 250 bucks. Same thing with my receptionist who, or my nurse who was making 60 but was getting a, a $69,000 contribution. It cost me about 225 bucks to cover her with term insurance. Um, and so what I've done is I've kind of flipped it on its head. And instead of keeping you know, 55% of the contribution, now my owner is keeping 99.5% of it. And that's tremendous. And, and the power of showing them that, aside from being, you know, I think, a, a nice number financially, it, it's, it's tremendously powerful emotionally. I mean, look what we've done. Hey, Doc, you've been working your butt off. Look how much extra money we're able to get you by doing the 79 plan. And again, it's not going to work for everybody. But it's going to be a nice fit for some of them. And I think you'll find a lot of people gravitate to that. And this is a, you know, this is a real world example. This is, I still do a lot of DB work. This is what I see. You know, and I just don't know why a doctor would go down that road to give all the money away to the employees. I don't think they would. Uh, at least we don't think they would. So one of the nice things about 79 is if they are doing that DB plan, so maybe you find a client, it is a doctor, he's doing a DB plan, and I think that's great. Um, they're doing a 401k plan. Are they a candidate? Can we do a 79 plan? Sure. It's a non-qualified plan, so it literally it'll just go right alongside those other ones, and it'll have no repercussions on, on what they're doing with their qualified planning. So they'll keep doing that, and then they'll do Section 79 uh, right on top of it. So it really has no effect on any of the qualified planning that they're already doing, which, again, it's, I just think it's an added value you can bring to them. Um, and this is really kind of similar, but really you're just, in this case, you're just stacking it on top um, of the qualified plans in this case. So you kind of what we'd call a combo, you know, almost in that case, where you're doing all the qualified plans, but you're, you're using Section 79 right on top of it. Um, and then finally, I want to talk a little bit about the products that we use inside of it. And, and specifically, the one from National Life is a wonderful product. Um, it's their Secure Plus Advantage 79 product. We have a lot of experience working with it and working with the folks at the home office. There's a couple different ways we can run it. Um, generally, one is what I would call, again, what I would call the exclusion focus, a little more tax focused. So it's for those people saying, I got plenty of money in retirement. I need to save some tax dollars today. That would be closer to your 60% inclusion mark. The other side is what we call the benefit focus for somebody, again, who's they're, they're focused on the tax deduction, but they want nice income as well. That's going to come in closer to probably 75 80% um, of inclusion. But, but either way, the policies are going to credit the same. And what they're going to do is, if you're familiar with these products, they're going to give you upside market uh, participation. So I, you know, I have to look at what the caps are right now. They change from time to time. But it could be anywhere from you know, a, a, an 8% cap um, you know, with 110% participation to a 6% cap with 140% participation or a 12% cap with 100% participation. And, and they're all different, but the, the point being, if the market returns a positive number, they're going to give you that positive number up to a certain point. Okay, so if the cap is 12 and the market returns 15, they're going to give you 12. So you still did pretty good, but you didn't do maybe as good as your buddy who gave his money to his investment guy and got 15%. The flip side to that is that when the market goes down, they're never going to credit you with less than zero. So now my buddy who just lost 40% in the market in 2008 
and is uh, not a very happy camper is asking me what I got on my life insurance policy, and well, I you know they credited me with zero, so I didn't lose anything except for you know some expenses taken out for the life insurance, but I was credited with zero. I didn't get minus forty percent. So in those down years, that's just it's just a huge, huge point for these, these type of products. Um, again, we know we're going to miss a little bit of the upside, but if I can protect you on the downside, you know, I think that resonates with a lot of people right now. Um, so they're really nice products. Uh, the Secure Plus Advantage, again, it's a really easy product to work with. What we do is we'll use the fixed crediting account for years one through five. And right now, I think the fixed crediting is at about it's five and a quarter. It's currently crediting, I think. It might be 5% right now. I'd have to check on that. Um, but it's never really gone below, I don't think, since we've been doing it, 4.5%, maybe 4.25%. Um, and so we use a very conservative, steady interest rate assumption for the first five years. After the first five years, you're done funding. Now what we do is we'd say, well, you may want to grow that cash value. Let's flip the switch to something equity index that's going to look a little better for you, give us some of that upside. Um, and at that point, you could choose whatever index you want to participate in. We have some clients, they stay in the fixed account. They like the fixed account. So um, that's just where they go. So, but they're equity indexed UL policies. Um, the national life policy, again, it's wonderful. Um, we can guide you, and that's one of the things we will do, is we'll ask you some information about the company. And if it's an under 10 case, like I said before, what they'll do is uh, national life will limit the amount of insurance someone can buy, because they're, they're giving them simplified issue. So that's where some of the, the things in the code you have to know about where uh, technically the life insurance company is not allowed to underwrite on a case that's under 10. So the, the, the give up there is that they will give the person the policy on a simplified issue, but they're only going to give you up to about $2 million worth of coverage. In most of my cases, that's been enough. Um, if it's $100,000 that someone's putting in and that person is, let's say they're 57 years old, again, it's only buying about $1.4 million, $1.5 million of life insurance. We're not buying it for death benefit protection. So in most cases, we're coming in under that $2 million mark on, on what would be known as an under 10 case. Um, and so I'm going to kind of step back now and, and just touch on some of these things. This is really, to summarize, this is, this is what we talked about, which is 79 is it's a voluntary plan. It's flexible. It's deductible at the corporate level, and again, it's a C corporation, so just a quick word about that. I know a lot of people will say, I don't have any C corps, and I don't work with C corps. All the companies I work with are S corps. You need to educate the, the CPA on, on why the C, C corp is important here. And I can tell you about why that is. It's, it's probably a call for another time, but the bottom line is it's a C corp. You need the C corporation. So the CPA may say, well, I got the guy set up. He's an LLC, but he files like an S corp. Will that work? No, we need an LLC that files like a C corp. And so now he says, well, I'm not really interested in converting him. You know, there's a reason I want to keep him as an S corp. OK, that's fine. But your client has a pre-tax profit here, and we're trying to come up with some solutions. We need a C corporation. What are we going to do? Well, let's think about what can we do. Can we create a C corporation? Sure. What's that C corporation going to do? Well, maybe they do the product purchasing for all of the, the widgets that you know, the company makes. OK, well, let's formalize that. Put that into a contract. Have somebody write it up. What's that company going to pay them to do all the purchasing? That kind of stuff. And that's where I think sometimes 79 can get a little complicated. It doesn't have to. But the bottom line is we need that C corporation. And if you can't find a way to get there, or your CPA won't get you there, don't waste your time. You're wasting your time on that. I say, say move on. You've got to recognize when the opportunity just isn't there. And if you have a CPA who doesn't like C corporations, don't try to convince them that they're wonderful, great entities. You're never going to convince them of that. But you need to maybe show them the value of why it's important. And then they'll help you get there if you need to get there. So that, that's just a quick word about working with the C corporations. Um, hey, Evan. And with uh, that, Evan, I'm done. Yeah. yeah. OK, Evan, I want to ask you a couple questions. Yeah. Um, OK, first of all, uh, being a TPA, you've got a lot of experience doing this with different agents all over the country. Uh, clients are small business owners, doctors, you know, tightly held companies. Uh, are, are you seeing any kind of business over and over? Like, is this pretty popular with doctors? Yeah, it's a good question. That's yes. The, the, that's exactly why we show the, the example about that doctor's office on there is because this, this seems to really resonate with them well. And I think it is because partly they do have a lot of highly compensated employees. So, you know, it's not uncommon to find a doctor 
or two doctors, and it's a small practice, but the people they have are expensive people. And so what we find is that this, this is, it resonates well with them um, in, in terms of, geez, I've looked at a profit sharing plan, you know, and we did it, and it was okay. I need something more. I'm making a lot of money, and I want to put more money away. But boy, I don't want to give this person $50,000 in contribution. What else can we think about? Um, so in terms of a you know, type of business, I think doctors work well. Um, I know doctors can be notoriously difficult to work with for a variety of reasons, but their, their organizational structure usually works well in regards to they're paying employees a lot of money. There's a lot of cost for that on a qualified level, and, and doctors are usually making money. We'll, we'll see how much they keep making here with Obama, but um, you know, most of them are making money. So in that respect, I think it's good. I do think, um, Ron, you get to a point where you've got, I wouldn't say too many employees, but you get to a critical mass point with 79 a little bit. And the reason that happens is because if I, if I have to put in a group term policy and I have 1,000 employees, that can be expensive. So maybe any yeah, savings so I would get in. for uh, smaller like, type companies. You got uh, it. You got it. Kind of why I asked the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Evan, uh, I got another question for you. Mm -hmm. This is a five-year funding. At the end of five years, if your client's 50 years old to start and he hits age 55, can't contribute anymore, typically what happens? Great question. What we do there is we'll start them on another policy. Quite honestly, that's exactly what we do. So, and the reason is they'll say, well, why can't I just keep putting money into this one? You know, I, I don't need a new one. You say, well, you really do because you're going to have a mech on your hands if we fill this up. And you may have to explain to them what that means and why, why you really don't want to do it. But what we would do is we would say, look, like you just said, Ron, you were 50 when we started this thing. You're 55 now. You're going to keep working for another 5, 10 years. You, you're still making money. We don't want to put more into this policy because it, it, we did exactly what we were going to do, and it's, it's filled, if you will. If you think of your policy like a glass, you filled it up to the rim. You don't want to put more into it. We would start you on a new one. And so some of those clients who you may have a 10, 15-year um, idea about working with this, this kind of concept on, what we've seen some people do is buy a term policy alongside the original, the original death benefit, uh, the original permanent policy that they're purchasing, so that five years down the line, I can say, well, look, maybe we convert the policy we bought for you. Now, I wish more people did that. But I can tell you right now, I just did a new policy for a client where it was a younger doctor. He was 44 years old when we started. He's 49 now. And exactly what you described happened. He filled up the policy, wanted to keep going. He's still working. And we literally are in the process of underwriting the new policy right now. What um, percentage of these things the renew after five years? You know, I wish it was a huge number. Um, I think the reality is, you know, I don't know which of the clients are still working with the same agents. I think there's a little bit of that. So I would say maybe 10% of them come back through and do another one. We've got some here locally. So again, I'm in Phoenix, so there's some cases here where I'm a little more involved or we've even got, you know, some personal cases we work on. We've got a couple doctors here who are in their third, what I would call their third round of funding. So year 12 okay. to 13, whatever that is. Okay. Now, uh, in case, uh, now this is for the agents, but I want to ask a question on behalf of the agents. There's a guy out there named Rocky DeFrancesco, and he's uh -huh. got quite a big email list. And yeah. he's a lawyer, a lawyer agent that thinks he knows everything. A couple years ago, he's hot to trot on Section 79. Mm -hmm. Now he's sending yeah. some bad press out. So I, I, do, I want to make a comment first. Yeah, sure. Because there's no one plan that's for everybody. Section 79 is going to be good for a whole bunch of people, but if they got a thousand employees, it's probably not a good plan for them. So, uh, uh, you want to make any kind of comment on this guy Rocky, yeah. who, by the way, is a know-it-all kind of guy. I, I, I don't really uh, like the guy. Yeah. Um, okay. But you know, in case they run into this, what's your yeah. comeback? Let me speak to two things about that, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up. You know, I've never met him before, um, Rocky De Francesco. And I've seen a lot of his articles. And you're right. A couple of years ago, he wrote some articles where he was, um, I'll be quite honest, and I know some National Life people are on the call, where he was real excited about Section 79 and this new policy and um, where you know, he thought it would be exciting. And um, he kind of went back into his hole a little bit, kind of does his thing. And you know, a lot of people, he has, a, he has a big distribution list, like you said, Ron. He has a lot of people who read his stuff you know, for better or worse. 
Um, and he kind of turned tail on it. And he said, why would you do a plan like this when I can take that same money and put it into one of these other policies, and it's better for you, income-wise. And that, that's basically what he's doing. He's trying to generate calls yeah, for Yeah, he just said, do an IUL yeah. instead of a Section that's 79. Exactly right. yeah. yeah, so he, he takes the whole, to, you know, the real kind of tax savings angle out of it and says, why would you do that if, if I can get you better money? Well, he never takes into account the, to the tax savings angle. And, and he speaks to a couple things in his letters that you'll see that I, I just don't like and I think are, are kind of um, – underhanded kind of marketing tax and it's just it's not accurate so one of the things he'll say is you know you're not telling the full story to the employees and um, you know what employee again would, would wave out of a benefit like this and you're being underhanded about how you you know you're selling this plan and, and that's just not true if anybody's seeing any of that or or they read any of that stuff or they've ever been on an enrollment meeting with us you, you'll see that, that there's nothing about that that's true and what that tells me is he's never sold a section 79 plan Again, I, I, would, I would point back to anybody who's ever really sold one, I think what you'll find is if you've ever sat down with a client and you sit down with their employees, the employees don't want to hear about taxable income. They don't. And so it being a voluntary plan means most of them will waive out. He doesn't like that, and, and he's used that as a sales point. So, so he's out there, and I would just, we just sent a reply recently because he sent some stuff. The thing we try to get people to take away is to think for yourself, and I think, Ron, you hit it. This is not a one-size-fits-all plan. You know, what worked for Mr. Jones down the street is not going to work for Mr. Petrenovich out, out in California. You need a different plan. And, and if I'm trying to ram this into every hole I can find, I'm going to make some people angry, and I'm probably going to do some bad planning. But if you're not yeah, looking so at never it... Ever it one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's never any one plan that's for everybody. A couple more really important questions. I hate to rush you. Why do we, no, need, no, why do we, need, a, why do we need a TPA? It's a pretty important sure, question. Sure. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm choking on something. Uh, you need a TPA because what you're going to get is, is your client's going to put in $100,000. Somebody has to calculate what they pick up in taxes. Because if they put the 100 in and never picked up anything as taxes, and someone from Washington or the IRS comes knocking, they're going to say, I think this is great. What a great plan you did. You, your company contributed this, this money for you. It's your policy. What did it cost you? Well, you know, I, didn't, I, I didn't pay anything for it. Hmm, well, that could be an issue. So what we do is we have an actuary we worked with in Indianapolis who helped us design our system. We take the values. So what we do is I'll run the insurance illustration for you. I'll put it into my proposal system. My proposal system will spit back what you need to pay in taxes. And it depends on, again, how we design the policy. More cash value is going to mean more taxable income up front, but it's going to mean more income on the back end. Less cash value up front is going to be less taxable income but it's going to be less on the back end. And so quite literally, there is a section of, the, of that code where it will tell you how to calculate what we call the quote unquote permanent benefit. And so the reality is, you could go do it and calc it all yourself. It's just, it, you come down to why would you when well, we LSW, told you? Yeah, LSW so, is not going to take it uh, if they do it the won't. number one. They, they won't. And, yeah. and it's just a point yeah, to say. Yeah, the TPA. Yeah. yeah, it's just math that we're doing, but we've built the system. We've gone through the nationalized system. We know how they want us to work. We know what they want us to send. Um, and so the reports that we sent out have been crunched by our actuary, and, and National Life has looked at all of our materials. They have, they have sanctioned what we send out. So that's why you need me. Hey, Ron, it's Ross at National and, Life. Can I, can I chime in for a second? Go ahead, Ross. Uh, yeah, so basically, you know, a lot of what the uh, TPA has to do as well is there. a lot of times they're a part of the underwriting process. So, oh, yeah. you know, we've, we've seen cases where, you know, the underwriter might come to the agent and say, hey, you know, we need this, this, and this from you, and then simply you just turn to the TPA, and the TPA says, no, we're good, we're good to go. So, you know, it, they really help you more than anything. We yeah. do, and I think that's important. You know, the under 10 rules to I have somebody in my office here, um, Jeanette Corbin, who will do all of your underwriting. She'll take the whole thing, and, and she'll work with the people at National Life. If you want to use your own underwriter, you can. But that's the kind of stuff. I think that's an excellent point. Yeah. And, and uh, what's the split percentage on a standard case? I mean, if you guys go in and do the whole thing, it's different. But the standard, you know, where you just do the TPA part, what's the split? Yeah. 20% is what we go on the app for. So, again, so it's 20%. Split. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and then, again, um, that, you know, we're, we're only getting paid if you sell the case. So, you know, we work for free until you sell it. Got it. Okay. A uh, couple more questions from the agents out there in the field, and I know we're running a little bit over. Uh, do you have – what other kind of tools 
can, uh, if you could uh, send me as much of, the, of your tools as you can so I can get them out to everybody. Sure. Uh, one of the questions from Bonnie, do you have a CPA focused presentation we can share with our CPA contacts? I do. I maybe have a, I, uh, yeah. Maybe the one we just saw. Well, you do. My feeling is, and I think Bonnie is kind of speaking to, the CPAs when I present this, they're the ones asking more of the tax-focused questions. So let's go back to that tax form you were looking at. I want to run through that. The answer is I do. I have one that's more focused for what I would call a CP, CPA presentation. So maybe what I'll do is I'll send them both to you, and then you can distribute as necessary. I'll get them out to everybody, yeah. Yeah, okay. That sounds good. Uh, the term, do we do the term, the group term through LSW, or do we take that somewhere else? You would take that somewhere else, and then what I tell people, unless LSW is doing group term now, but I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, um, either, so. Yeah, I don't think so. So you always need, and it's a good question because the answer, you know, what I like to tell people is I think it's great we're talking about this permanent life insurance for your client, but we got to get group term insurance as well. We always need to have the underlying group term policy. You could use whoever you want for the group term policy. Um, I can tell you from experience, most of the people, if they don't have it, they'll ask us to quote it out for them, which I'm happy to do. And what I usually tell people is if that's what you want me to do, we'll be the agent on the case. It's usually their very small group term um, quote. It's, it's, and the it's reason almost is, no premium, yeah. It's almost no premium. It's just a lot easier that way. I literally just had a case where I left it all with the client and the agent signed the page, but we got the quote, and now I've got to go through this whole thing where we got to sign it or he's got to get licensed. So you could do it either so way. Typically, it's the easiest yeah. just to let you guys handle the group term part. That's the easiest. The other thing I always tell people is I usually will tell them if your client is offering health insurance already, get them to pick up the phone and make a call to the health insurance company and ask them if they can tack on some group term insurance. Number one, they've already got the census, and number two, they'll probably do it really cheap for you. Okay. Next question. I, I, I'm going fast here. Uh, the primary insured, the business owner, the C-Corp, are the ABRs in place since this is a national life group product? Yes, sir. Okay. That's a good answer. Uh, what are your suggestions for the minimum premium contributions to make it make sense for a business? These are good questions. Uh, 25000 is what we look for on one of the principles. And the reason one of the principles is important is we do have cases where, again, it's four doctors, but only two want to participate. So what we would say is 25000 on one of them. And it's not to say I can't do a policy for 10000 but you know, at some level, I go, wait a minute. I'm only making 20% of whatever that target is. It's not a lot for me. And I think at those levels, you're back into 401k, profit sharing territory at that point, unless you really, really want to do an insurance policy. But we would ask you to look for a minimum of 25. Got it. Uh, can we get the PowerPoint? Yes, I'm going to send out. Evan, if you could send this to me as soon as possible, I'd like to get sure. out right away because I'm traveling for the rest of the day. Will do. Yeah. Uh, do. Why do they have to use fix for the first five years, uh, Bonnie? That's just to be conservative. To have no zero years in the first five years. That's how the whole plan is designed. Yeah, and, and a quick word uh, about that too. Is more, yeah. Will this become better or worse with Obamacare? I'll guarantee you this: with Obama tax, it's it's better. <laughs> Who knows yep. about o Obamacare? But with Obama tax, uh, we got the edge. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, okay. And Ron, if you want, Person. I'm happy to have any of the agents can call me direct. You can do whatever you want, um, but my phone is always on, and if they want to call me, that's fine with me, or they can go through you. I don't, it's it, either way. Okay. A couple more questions. Are, are there any other TPAs that we use at National Life Group? There's three total. Uh, I've talked to the guys in the home office. They highly rec recommend these guys. That's very nice. Look through the same everywhere, you guys. So why not use the best? I've been told they're the best. Well, I appreciate that. Good, you know, and they've got no real reason to say that. Uh, can these be offered to government employees? No. It's got to be the C Corp. Yeah, Michael. Yep. Uh, I think uh, after this, we've, I think you guys, we've got enough questions in. Evan, thank you. There's his phone number. You guys, I really want to thank you for uh, getting so many people on the call. This is a very real business opportunity. You've got a great third party here. 
the case, you know, if you have a client, potential client, get the information you need, uh, then call up ECI, they'll start working on the case together with you. So thanks, okay. Evan. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Evan, get me those emails, and I'll get them out there to the inner circle. Well, thanks Take for having me on. I appreciate it. Okay. Ross? Yeah. Good talking with you, Ross. All right, you guys have a good one.